a competition that many of us love to hate, but nevertheless watch every year in our millions. Who can forget the phrase, Norway nul point, and those tragic moments when the Royaume-Uni came way down the table. Let's take a trip down memory lane to see how the look of the event has altered. This contest, of course, as you'll have gathered, is a massive annual event, a far cry indeed from the BBC's first Eurovision in 1960. Ladies and gentlemen, you have met the artists, and here on this giant scoreboard beside me, you can see the title of the song they're going to sing and the countries they represent. So at this point, I will hand you over to a team of international commentators who will each describe their scene on their own national audiences throughout Europe. That was Katie Boyle, of course, in 1960, and meet Mike Parse, who's mad about Eurovision. That's a far cry, isn't it, from the look of the contest nowadays? Mm, very much so, very much so. It's difficult to describe to anyone the enormous amount of work that went into the production of last year's contest, which I was lucky enough to be in attendance at in, in Birmingham. Uh, the amount of camera changes, stage changes, and work that went into every production from everybody all across Europe. Um, you know, whereas in, in the old days, people would just come on, stand in front of the microphone, sing their songs, and walk off, etc. Nowadays, it's more like a, a, a production rather than just a, a walk on, walk off event for all the performers. But it's the butt of so many jokes, Eurovision, isn't it? What makes you persevere in proclaiming to all and sundry that you love it to the point of collecting just about everything you can? Well, to I, think do with it, it? I think, Debbie, it just boils down to personal taste in music. Um, everybody has different tastes, everybody enjoys different kinds of music and I happen to enjoy European pop music which is the kind of music that comes out in the Eurovision Song Contest around the countries uh, along the continent and in Scandinavia etc which I think is very very different to British pop music. You see while we tend to joke and we tend to make jibes all the time about the event the facts are that in other parts of Europe it is as big an event as events like the Cup Final and the Grand National are in this country. So the whole, the whole of Norway and Sweden stop on Eurovision night and their Song for Europe finals, their national finals, are three hour cabaret shows that practically everybody watches in their countries and it's all over the front pages, the tabloids, all that sort of thing. It, it's, it, it's just one of those things and this country doesn't seem to be taken seriously by anybody. I don't really understand why but whereas in other parts of Europe it's, it's a victim of its own success really. You've got loads of records here, LPs and singles and as you say loads of them with foreign titles, mm. foreign artists. Which of all of them is your favourite? My all time favourite entry from the Eurovision was the Danish entry from 1984, which is from a, a group called Hot Eyes, who actually represented the contest three times for Denmark in 84, 85 and 88. Um, all three were superb pop songs. Uh, they weren't serious songs, but they were just great, good time, enjoy yourself pop songs. And they were, they were very big in their, their countries as well at the time, so th they would be my favourites. But there's lots and lots. I mean, it's usually the Scandinavian countries that I like the best, but that's just a general statement. There's loads and loads from all across Europe, which I enjoy. Interesting to be reminded of some of the faces from the past. I mean, Samantha Janus, who we now think of as an actress. Well, she's one of our leading actresses. She's on nearly every show in the evenings, it, it seems. And she represented the UK in 1991 with a very strong song called A Message to Your Heart. And it finished way down the field. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't, very, it wasn't one of our most successful finishing positions, but I thought it was one of our best songs. And it was surprising that she didn't do, do so well. But now she's making a name as an actress, but not many people know that she actually started off singing for Britain in the Eurovision. And a reminder here of Celine Dion Celine in the previous Dion. life. Uh, nobody really thought of her in this country until she sang in 1992. I think it was The Power of Love or one of those that got her uh, to number one. But she actually won the contest in 1988 when it was in Ireland. And she beat the UK entry, which was uh, Scott Fitzgerald singing Go. And Scott Fitzgerald himself was a, was a big star in this country. And if I, if I had words, you might remember, in 1978. So again there, um, nobody knew that Celine would go on to be as successful as she is. And you know, I've never ever heard Celine sing her winning song ever on any radio, television <laughs> or any program. It, well, it's a shame because I think it's one of her best ever songs. Mm. Very, very strong song. I'm amazed at how much trivia you have at your fingertips. Are there many other serious Eurovision fans out there? Quite a few, yes, quite a few. There's about a thousand of us in a fan club and we get together once every year for a convention and we have a really good weekend. But it's a terrific uh, event because everybody enjoys it and everybody gets together and has a good weekend with e enjoying each other's company and listening to all the Eurovision songs and videos and things. Well, Mike, you've got a unique collection here. Thanks very much for bringing it in to show us. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you.